Hey everybody, I'm Paul Yeager. This is the MTOM Show podcast, a production of Iowa PBS and the Market to Market TV show. We're back in the studio again before we head out for some fun episodes on the road, but we brought in a guest who's on the road traveling from Illinois to Iowa. We were able to get Scott Irwin to come into the studio, and Scott's at the University of Illinois. Uh, mind of like no other when it comes to farm economics. We are going to discuss a whole lot of things about agriculture, his background, and what he likes to do on social media with those of you who might follow him on Twitter or X or whatever it's being called right now. Scott just put together a whole bunch of stories in a new book. So we're going to talk about the book, some of the good stories that are in there, and then we are going to intersperse a whole lot of uh, discussion on topics in general. We think uh, this is one that a lot of you are going to enjoy. I'm one of them. I hope you enjoy it. Now, let's get to Scott Irwin. I meant what I said a few years ago the last time you were on this podcast. Anytime you're in Iowa, I'd love to chat. You're an Iowa guy, Bagley. Absolutely. So who's still from the family on the farm? Well, no one actually lives physically on the uh, farm ground. Um, my mom, uh, long retired, uh, but my partner in marketing our crops, uh, lives in Jefferson. And then I have a nephew uh, who farms the land, and he actually lives not too far from here in Waukee and then commutes back and forth to farm the land. Oh, well, if you're in Waukee, that's that's like a, that's just a couple of 40s away. It's, it's Waukee extends so far west here. Yeah, exactly. Uh, what prompted you to not stay on the farm and chase academics? Uh, great question. Um, my dad, when I was growing up, built a, a pretty good-sized farming operation uh, in West Central Iowa, uh, uh, corn, soybeans, and hogs. Uh, but I always had kind of an academic bent. But And when I went off to Iowa, Iowa State, I thought that's probably what I was going to do was to come home to the farm like so many of my friends uh, at Iowa State. But uh, I had uh, several experiences at Iowa State, which I tell about in my book, in particular one uh, crazy adventure. I am always grateful to uh, uh, his name was Dean Lewis uh, Thompson. Uh, he was the associate dean for students in the college bag at the time. And uh, uh, literally could have expelled me, but instead <laughs> encouraged me to go to graduate school. And that kind of put me on a different path. And I kind of found myself uh, personally late in my undergraduate days uh, in terms of loving academics and research. And then I went off to Purdue to graduate school, and it did not take me long while there to realize that this is really what I think I was made to do, and I've never looked back. When you say Dean... It makes me think you're talking about Dean Wormer from Animal House, especially when you say you were almost expelled. I'm sure there's a story there, but you're not. Is that in the third book you'll talk about? No, that's in the. That's and how in, you were almost expelled is in the book. Yes, it's oh, I love it. it's it's I, uh, it's a chapter entitled "Towing Icebergs," and I'll <laughs> leave it at that. But uh, I am truly forever grateful to uh, uh, Dean Thompson, who was himself a giant in the field of agronomy, and I tell the story in the book how. Um, that actually was the starting point for two things. One, really starting to think seriously about life and maybe going to graduate school. This is the first person who ever talked to me about it. And then secondly, uh, it was he planted a seed about uh, building uh, statistical models to forecast uh, crop yields. Mm. And it's something that I've done quite a bit of now in my university research, and I also have a, a small uh, side business uh, called Yieldcast, where we um, produce real-time corn and soybean forecasts for the U.S. And it all traces back to this uh, uh, incredibly stupid incident. I'll call it sophomoric because I was a sophomore at Iowa State, but it 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 had a happy ending. You end up at Purdue, mm -hmm. grad school. Um, and what I've heard from academics who are economists at such and such university, I'm like, how come you're not in your home state? There's a reasoning, right, that home, you don't usually work in your home state 
you have to go to a different state? Is uh, there's there's a lot of different um, models. Um, there are some people that get educated in their home state and work there. For example, one of my great early mentors at Iowa State was Neil Harrell. I don't know if you, you oh, ever yeah. interviewed Neil, and uh, he's a person that stayed home. Uh, uh, I looked at various graduate schools, and it was I just knew that I fit at Purdue, and that place just really changed my life. That's where I really got serious about uh, my direction in life and uh, forever grateful for that place. And so that's uh, where I did my graduate training, I was able to continue my interest in grain markets, commodities, and futures markets. And then I decided I wanted to make a career out of academics. And I got my first job, actually, as a faculty member at Ohio State. It's so long ago, most people don't, don't don't even know about it, but I spent my first 12 years as an ag econ professor at Ohio State, and now the last, I think, 26 or 27 years at Illinois. Yeah, I wanted to go back to, yeah, when did you enter the job market from grad school at Purdue? What years are we talking here? 84, 85. Okay, so 84, 85. Mm-hmm. Huge that you study now. I mean, those are years that you look at. You were in the middle of not on the farm, but you knew enough from your tra- your undergrad and your grad training of this is a serious situation right here and then. What is it about living in real time, studying academics, and then now living today, working today? You've hit that gamut in real time. Has it given you perspective that maybe somebody else doesn't have? I think that it does. Uh, for example, one debate that has been ongoing uh, recently is uh, about inflation the pattern of uh, the general price level and the consumer price index in the U.S. And having lived through the uh, burst of inflation in the 70s and early 80s, and then the reaction of the Fed to raising interest rates uh, to a very high level, uh, you've I'd seen that pattern before. And so I thought that's what it was going to take to tame our current episode, which, you know, a year, 18 months ago, people thought that was kind of, you know, somebody that's even 40 will think, well, that can never happen. Well, it has happened before. So I I do think it gives me uh, uh, some, hopefully, some uh, learned wisdom that I can help on my um, professional activities. And that, you know, and a big question right now in Corn Belt agriculture is, you know, are we in a kind of asset bubble like we went through in the late 70s, early 80s? Big question, big question. And, uh, you know, early in my career, I was a part of uh, that debate and some of the research that tried to um, disentangle what happened in, in the late 70s and 80s. And, you know, my analysis right now is uh, not the same, uh, but there are some uh, warning lights that are flashing in my mind that uh, others may not agree with. So you're saying in August of 2023, you are still seeing warning lights. Did you see the same warning lights 18 months ago? Yes. Were they different lights? No. Same lights? Big one. What's the big one? interest rates. You know, we just have a generation, almost two generations of people in U.S. agriculture who have known nothing but historically uh, low, low, low interest rates. You know. uh, Less than double digits for sure. And, you know, you find somebody that's 35 or under and and they think the norm is three or four percent interest rates, and you know, I, I still, you know, I still think we're working through a big change in a capital-intensive sector like agriculture from a abnormally low uh, level of interest rates to now something that I think is a new normal. Uh, that will be much higher because, you know, in the long run, 
it's really not terribly complicated. Um, the nominal level of interest rates, like take the prime interest rates, and if it's, um, say, the prime interest rates, uh, seven or eight uh, percent, then you would subtract from that the rate of inflation to get what we call, economists call the real rate of interest. And historically, that has had to have been the real rate of interest, two to four percent for you not to have huge dislocations in the economy in terms of the allocation of capital to, to its most efficient uses. And, you know, we have been run, had been running for a long time in an environment, uh, not a long time, but a number of years where the real rate of in, interest was negative. That has never been a steady state equilibrium historically, but I think some people began to think that that was the new normal. And I think we're going to go back to what it's always been, which is that uh, you're going to have to pay to borrow money uh, in a real sense. And that's a sea tide change for agribusinesses, very large scale, all the way down to the average farmer on operating no loans. And that, that, that's the big change in my opinion. Do you think that the interest rate change that you speak of, the sea change, that it will trickle into others in the economy outside of agriculture? I look at housing. I look at business expansion. I look at communities borrowing money to bond projects. That all has a price tag to it. Absolutely. I mean, that's one of the most important economic variables in an economy is the level of interest rates. You know, right now, I thought that the very rapid rise in the federal funds rate, which is what the Federal Reserve Bank controls, uh, you know, it was the, the most rapid increase since 7980 uh, when I was incidentally uh, a senior at Iowa State and li lived through that real time. And uh, I thought it was going to drive us into a recession. And right now it looks like we've weathered that and we're not going into a recession, which is, uh, you know, really good news. But at the same time, uh, that rapid of a change, basically in the cost of money, uh, takes time to filter through uh, an economy. Mm -hmm. The Fed is seeming to signal that they're, going to be resolute in uh, really uh, driving inflation out of the economy. And we've made quite a bit of progress, but to get down to their targets is going to take this level of interest rates and probably a little bit higher for quite a bit longer. And the full implications of changing the price of money that much, I think is still to be played out. Earlier, you almost wanted me to ask, are we on that when you're talking about, um, well, you just said the recession word, but inflation, are we getting that soft landing that the Fed and the Biden administration talked about and, and tried to say, when you look at the gentle fall of many things, consumer price index, producer mm -hmm. price index, the PCE, all are coming down, look pretty steady. Is it? Yes. I, th I, th I think that we are right now with the data that we have, particularly with the last uh, quarter's GDP numbers, um, you could say cautiously, carefully, that uh, a little more optimism about that soft landing uh, scenario. And uh, it's going to take another quarter or two of data for us to know that mm -hmm. for sure. But I am personally... Um, more optimistic than I was uh, three or six months ago that that we might might do that. And I just the week we're recording this, uh, I believe it was the I don't think it was it was the stock market talking about twenty percent, twenty one percent already. We've had a, a gain this year in mm -hmm. stock values of that. I know they're not the same. I know the stock market's not the same as the economy, but the average consumer thinks it is. And they look at that, and, and that's a pocketbook thought mm -hmm. of the economy, not necessarily a, well, it's much more complex than that. 
Then you look at uh, your alma mater for grad school, Purdue, and their sentiment with farmers. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, it's been pretty negative for a long, long time. Hey, maybe it isn't so bad. Mm -hmm. Is that because public relations is working with the people telling us what's changing the economy, or is it something else? Well, in general, in the economy, um, I think, you know, we're seeing low employment, some wage growth, and that an, um, reasonably steady decline in the inflation rate. So, you know, you wouldn't say the economy is roaring, but it is uh, certainly better than a recession. Farmers, I think that sentiment is uh, highly correlated with the price of corn and soybeans. And so, you know, we've been rallying and, uh, you know, I've just been back the last four days uh, in my home area visiting folks and uh, was uh, around, you know, the markets are have taken a real tumble this week and uh, sentiment's not as strong as it was. And I think farmers are actually seem pretty nervous after this price drop uh, about what might be ahead. Well, they're seeing the market drop, and a lot of the reasoning for at least corn and soybeans, and to an extent wheat dropping, is because there's rain in the forecast or rain is falling. Right. But if you look at those rain strips, they're strips. They're not wide paths of a, of a paintbrush. So you drive from Illinois to Iowa. Mm -hmm. What do you see? And I mean, there's, some, there's a lot of corn and soybeans produced on what your drive was between these right. two spots. What'd you see? Well, I do look at, you know, it's kind of funny. I, I uh, get uh, what I call extensive walking around looking in fields uh, in my immediate home area uh, near Champaign, uh, Illinois. So I, I, I think I have a pretty good handle on what's going around there. And then in West Central Iowa, I come out here and do it. The rest is a windshield survey. So <laughs> take that for uh, what it is. Um, as dry as most of Illinois started, I mean, the first 45 days of the growing season in Illinois, and in particular, you know, East Central Illinois were miserably dry, near record dry. And we looked terrible, you know, basically going into the first week of July. And we've just, now we've gotten enough rain to um, green things up and things look a lot better. Um, still, not sure what the impact of that early, really dry period will be, but I've been in the fields and that's surprisingly good. Uh, the soybeans, especially as they can, have weathered that mm -hmm. storm. And if they get good rain, we're going to have very good soybeans in most of Illinois, I think. Uh, corn, I think, is very variable and hard, but you know, basically all the way on I-74 through Galesburg, Quad Cities, and then on an ID. And, um, you know, the, the crops are green. And uh, I didn't happen to drive through any of the really, really bad dry areas. Like you get into northern Iowa, southern Minnesota, yeah. Missouri. So, but the area that I drove through looks pretty good. Um, and in particular, you go west from here, uh, it just gets better and better and better. And in our area of West Central Iowa in Guthrie and Greene County, where our farms are located, I, you know, spent two two days tromping around there. And I can, I can honestly say, I don't recall at this uh, date on the calendar, the crops ever looking any better. And the soybeans in particular um, could be, again, they have a whole month and they need some rains to finish out. But, uh, you know, last day of July, I was in our fields and the soybeans are up to my hips and I'm six foot three. Uh, so I went, whoa, these could be some phenomenal beans. So uh, that's what I've seen. You just need to keep those ever returning derechos at bay. Oh, I mean, I mean, that, that was the problem in 2020. Absolutely. I mean, we just got hit full force mm -hmm. with that in, in our part of the state. And, you know, we have had, and it could be, you know, the climate change issue. Uh, we've had more severe uh, late summer wind storms than I recall growing up. Mm -hmm. uh, and so everybody kind of 
holds their breath on that. And, and that is reflected in the uh, insurance premiums for, for wind damage in our area. So, uh, but uh, I could tell the way I judge talking to the farmers in our area, what are the real prospects is when the farmers aren't complaining about something about the way things look in their fields, you know, because, and it's okay. I understand why they're so conservative at this point in the year. You don't want to get uh, over optimistic, but I didn't find anybody telling me really anything negative except, yeah, we could sure use a rain to finish things off. If that's all you've got, you've got really good crops. <laughs> One of the old phrases we used on market was as we sit here tonight, as we sit here right now, Scott, you have what I call a, well, I don't know if I should call it Twitter or X celebrity status <laughs> of sorts. You have no, you've been known to take to the keyboard and educate all of us who follow you mm -hmm. on a lot of topics. One of them has been renewable fuels, ethanol mm -hmm. economics is another, a lot of data that you have. The farm doc uh, is full of all sorts of good stuff. What's your favorite thing to talk about on the internet on, on that site of 140 characters or whatever it is up to now? Um, probably my personal favorite is, uh, you know, corn and soybean yield prospects. That's what, you know, I, I guess, I guess that's, the, I've never fully left the farm that, that I feel that way. Um, so prospects, we just covered a little bit on what mm -hmm. you covered. Um, what's the one that gets the most attention when you tweet about it? Oh, that's easy. Uh, biofuels. You, ooh, that's a, that's a minefield. Uh, uh, as an economist, I enjoy uh, my analysis and jousting uh, on social media in the biofuels area the most because it's just such an interesting space and markets and policy mix uh, to try to disentangle and understand what's going on. And as you know, uh, it's uh, politically highly controversial. It's a topic everybody seems to have strong opinions are, mm -hmm. gets kind of emotional. Uh, so uh, I, I probably enjoy that. That's, I guess, my... Uh, uh, combative debating uh, uh, part of my personally comes out. I really like to do that, and I, and I think I've, I've, I try to do analysis and work that helps everybody out in the in that sector to sort through some really hard economic and policy questions. Which to me, I mean, a book allows you to cover topics in depth. But I will see a tweet series from you, Scott, of eight, nine, ten thought. The the forum doesn't quite seem to fit what an academic would like. Well, it is unique. And I, I, I don't have really have any other colleagues in the profession who seem to enjoy, um, you know, the the Twitter arena. I don't know what it says about my personality, but I have loved Twitter from the first day I got on it. And so I, Oh, are you calling it X yet? Sorry. I, that is going to probably be <laughs> uh, impossible for an old dog like me to make that uh, switch because I've been at it so long. But, you know, it's really important to me, um, especially at this stage of my career, I view myself as a public servant, you know, uh, my salary is paid for by the citizens of the state of Illinois. And, uh, you know, the thing that I enjoy most about my career at this stage is engaging with the broad public, especially the agricultural community. And Twitter is, uh, I think, used properly the best um, channel for having an immediate impact on what I call the conversation. What people are thinking about mm. and what are they wanting to um, understand or maybe make a decision today. And I really personally like being part of that conversation. 
who do you find is engaging in debate with you? It, it's kind of an ever-changing cast of people. Uh, depends on the topic, uh, but uh, a lot of farmers, and, and that's great. That's who I've always wanted to be my core audience. Um, and then it's commodity traders, commodity analysts, um, uh, and uh, sometimes it's investors. It's it's surprising where it will come from, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, people in Washington D.C. Uh, in kind of the policy community on biofuels. So it's it's a it, it's a large number of people. At what point in what you're asked in a question or a direct message or a mention? Do you take someone's statement or thought on a topic that might be different than yours and turn that into something for a book, a paper, a column? You've been writing more columns again. Mm -hmm. At what point does that serve as inspiration and a, a chance for you to give pause and reflect and maybe change? That actually happens all the time. I would say today... Uh, well, really, the last five years, I've gotten most of my good ideas have been sparked by seeing something on Twitter or the engagement with something that I have tweeted out. And uh, many of uh, the articles that I write on Farm Doc Daily uh, really have their origin. Uh, and somebody will say something, I'll go, oh, I never thought of it quite like that. I think I could do X to address that question. And so I love, that's why I love so much being part of the conversation in such a real-time way, because I feel like it gives me a real uh, early look at the most important questions, and I can respond quickly. And, you know, I like to do that. Uh, so... Um, that's, that's how that happens. Um, and I it also has provided some, uh, uh, really funny stories that have ended up in my book. But doesn't that make you a flip flopper if you're changing your viewpoint on things? I mean, it happens in the political arena all the time. Mm -hmm. You can't change your opinion on things. I didn't think academics or scientists. I mean, you could go back to the COVID when that was the big scream mm -hmm. of how can you think about something different? Well, that's a challenge, uh, but I have the advantage of uh, a lot of experience. I've been at, if you like, this game almost 40 years, and so I'm pretty confident in um, anything I put out there in public. I'm certainly not, and I know I'm not always right, and I try to listen to, and I've learned to listen to good faith criticism. I've learned to listen to it because that's often where I get my best ideas. And um, so, and if it causes me to, I won't change my opinion or uh, a conclusion unless I've got solid analysis and evidence, either my own or someone else's. Uh, that's, I like to think I'm very data driven. And if the data leads me to a different uh, position or conclusion, I'll change my mind. And I'm not a, the least bit apologetic about that because I believe as an economist and a researcher and a scientist, that's what I'm supposed to do. That doesn't bother me at all. Universities, academic institutions, uh, research have come under fire because they're biased this way. They're influenced this way. Make a case. Defend all of academia mm -hmm. and why it needs to continue mm -hmm. or has its time come and it's not needed anymore? Well, I'm not really going to comment on other parts of the university. Uh, but what I do know in my part of the university, which is traditional colleges of agriculture, that I still believe that um, the colleges and play a hugely important role in basically on one side of the spectrum supporting 
the R&D for this sector. And then what I do heavily is analysis and communication uh, to the broad agricultural community, help them think through um, complicated economic and policy questions and get to a more informed position. I am as convinced of the value to our society of doing that as I was 40 years ago. Uh, and you can make a reasonable argument given the complexity of the, some of the questions like climate change and carbon markets and things like that, that it's even more important than it was uh, 40 years ago. So um, I think we have a very, very important role to play in the university, but there, there, there's one condition on that. You have to have a robust engagement of that institution as a return to the public on their investment. And, uh, and so I try to do in my small part in um, making sure that the university is really reaching out to the broad public as a return on the investment. Which is what you're saying is Twitter. Exactly. You. That's your engagement. Or it could be you go and speak to the Bureau County corn exactly. growers. Exactly. You get questions from them. And and, and, and and I still continue to do all of the above. But in today's world, um, it is really still to me kind of – I'm shocked at um, – the power and pervasiveness of social media, even within agriculture. So, you know, I went back to uh, where my mom lives in Jefferson and first day we were there, we went up to a sandwich shop on the square and turns out there were a couple of farmers up there that uh, uh, I'd known, uh, they're about my age. And, uh, you know, they followed me on Twitter and he said, don't put anything out on how good the crops are too much because you'll drive the market down, Erwin. And I thought, what a changed world that that would be my conversation in a sandwich shop in Jefferson, Iowa. And uh, I understand it, but it, uh, I, I, I think I was fortunate that I saw the power of social media uh, for this engaging with the public um, early. And it's, um, it's proved its worth. And now the book. Mm -hmm. You mentioned – columns and it's not just a collection of columns no but what is it about academics and books i mean is this what you're going to lecture on i mean is this what <laughs> that's always the joke with right. the academics that you make this as your class book and that's the way you make a little bit money why is the printed word in a world of 12 second videos before i scroll to the next one how does this fit into the context and the debate back and forth with with people there's still a true book, means you have a book length treatment of a subject, which means in one way, shape, or form, it's in depth, it's extensive, it's comprehensive in a way that short videos, tweets, uh, a LinkedIn post, Facebook post cannot be. Uh, and so to be, there's obviously still a place for that because millions of books are still sold every year, uh, tens of million. So that's um, that's the value. Do you find they're easy to do? Huh. It was one of the hardest things I've ever done. This particular book uh, was my first one. And it uh, took my uh, co-author and I over five years to uh, finish. In five years, now granted, this probably went to print in, say, January, February, yeah. since we're in August. A lot of changed from January of 2023, even in the rewind five years. So did you find that as things, as a global pandemic and the response to it, did you have to rip up and delete a lot of things? Not too much. Okay. It was more adding some uh, material in the final section of the book. Basically, this book uh, is very unique, and so I'm, I'm proud of that. Uh, I 
decided in the latter part of my career, I wanted to do something very different. I wanted to teach people what I have been studying my entire professional career, commodity markets, but I did not want to write another boring textbook because I know very only students who are forced to buy it read those. I wanted to write something that um, the general readership, the average person could pick up and read and enjoy and in the process, you know, kind of slip in and teach them what I've been studying my whole adult life. And so um, that's what I tried to, to produce. And I, th I think we were reasonably successful. Uh, it's a very unusual book in the, in the style. In order to make it entertaining and that carry people along so, so that they're not bored by the more, um, if you will, academic uh, technical material, Every chapter begins with some kind of wild and crazy story, in particular from my growing up uh, in the 60s and 70s on an Iowa farm and uh, uh, pretty wild country boys. And they're wild stories, and but they're all there for a purpose. A friend of mine described them as uh, market parables, these, these wild, wild things that happen to me. I, I use in every chapter a way to motivate, um, you know, the subject of the book, of that chapter in the book. And maybe how you got nearly expelled from a university. Well, that's in there. <laughs> um, but I, I, for example, I, I have this dear, dear lifelong friend uh, who I just saw yesterday afternoon. Um, he still lives in Yale, Iowa. Uh, his name is, uh, you won't mind not naming him, Jack Hunter. And he was my partner in crime growing up. And uh, a fearless human being is how I would describe him. So in the third chapter of my book, I wanted to introduce people to the idea uh, of a, um, oh, excuse me, in the second chapter of the book, I introduced uh, the idea of what does a speculator do in commodity markets. And so Jack is my stand-in for a speculator and, you know, our wild and crazy behavior, particularly in cars. Uh, and then in the next chapter I introduce, uh, or later chapter, I introduce hedgers. Uh, and what are hedgers? And I use my dad as a stand-in for uh, understanding what, what a hedger does mm -hmm. in the markets. And so that's kind of the theme of the book. Do you hope that it's somebody on the farm that reads it, grew up on the farm, is no longer there, or someone in a town that has no idea where their food comes from? All of the above. Uh, I think that uh, it's a comprehensive enough treatment of the subject of commodity markets, broadly speaking, that you know, the most advanced uh, farmer marketer can learn some things out of it, all the way to the person that maybe never lived on a farm, mm -hmm. no connection to agriculture, but maybe they're thinking, I'd like to speculate in the commodity markets. Mm -hmm. They can learn something. The book is basically divided into thirds. The first third is the basics, covering um, what's a commodity, what's a uh, speculator in the commodity futures markets, what's a hedger, and how does trade work. And then the middle third is relaying, um, telling the story of the great speculation controversy that erupted in globally in 2007, 2008. And then the last third of the book is what I call the future of futures. We get, you know, electronic markets, talk about cryptocurrency. Uh, we talk about what happened in crude oil when uh, crude oil futures prices went negative in the early stages of the pandemic. Uh, and so looking forward to where these markets may be headed. Okay, if I ask you this question, if it steals the thunder of the end, but mm -hmm. what is the future of futures? I think it's very bright. Uh, because we've had a quantum change in the cost and uh, ex uh, made it so much cheaper and easier to have access. Uh, so uh, in that sense, you know, electronic trading's made it cheap. 
um, electronic digital world has made it access easy. So that's the really positive part. The challenge for that industry as it becomes more and more vertically integrated and industrialized, like the livestock futures markets are now struggling to survive because there's not as much uh, openly negotiated, traded um, uh, of that particular commodity. But the history is that that industry is hyper competitive and it innovates and it i think it will continue to innovate i mean it's just phenomenal uh, the sophistication and the directions that it's going in places like energy trading i think that uh, um, as we uh, develop carbon trading rins in the biofuels area uh, are i think an early experience with kind of environmental policy, natural resource markets, I think those are could be your, a big new frontier in what we have traditionally called commodity futures markets. I uh, can't decide if I want to do this. Here we go. In, I, I won't put a, I won't put a time period on this. Will we be trading carbon futures like we trade ethanol or corn or beans today? Because ethanol wasn't something we traded until right, recently. Right. Do you think carbon and all its politicalness that's tied to it now? Because at first it wasn't. Now it's become heavily that way in states trying to build these pipelines, or which is all tied to the issue in general. I believe that we will, but it will probably take more time than kind of this current early wave enthusiasm. Uh, uh, we have to deal with climate change. We're still struggling exactly um, how our societies want to do that. Um, but I think slowly but surely uh, policies and changes are going to be made to, to figure out how to deal with it. And it's just hard for me not to imagine that one part of that response will be open trading of carbon. And, you know, the biggest example of that right now is uh, the California low carbon fuel standard and their trading of carbon credits in California. Um, I really think that that's going to spread eventually across the country. I could dive into that. There's a whole other thought I have on that, but maybe we'll save that for the next time you come home and we can discuss it. But the name of the book is Back to the Futures, Crashing Dirt Bikes, Chasing Cows. It's Scott Irwin. Do I have it right? You do. All right. Thank you so much for coming in. Good to see you in person. And we didn't have to exchange uh, a lot of tweets back and forth. I'll go easy on us on Twitter. Oh, uh, well, I could say that back at you. <laughs> My thanks to Scott. Back to the Futures. Here we go. We're back to the present next week. New Tuesday or new episodes come out each and every Tuesday. We hope you enjoy. Like, subscribe, share, tell a friend. That really means a lot. Thank you for listening, watching, or reading. We'll see you next time. Bye bye.